Good morning, everyone. We'll call the commission meeting to order. First two items under the consent agenda is the minutes and the treasurer's report. If there are no adjustments to either one of those, I would entertain one motion to approve. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Under action items, we have the 2018 audit report. Um, Andy is with us this morning somewhere. Right in yep, front. There he is. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Andy Berg with Abdo Ike Myers here to present the 2018 audit report. I'll cover um, the results of the audit, including our audit opinion. I'll go over some of the uh, financial information for 2018, including some trend information over a, a period of time. And I'd be happy to take any questions. I believe you have uh, our management communication letter in front of you, so I'll walk through that if you want to follow along. So on, uh, if you open that up on page two, our responsibility in performing the audit is to issue an opinion. Uh, we issued an unmodified or clean opinion, so the best opinion you can get. As part of the audit, we also issue a report on Minnesota legal compliance. So if you turn to page three of the management letter, uh, the state auditor has um, seven different areas that we test. Um, a couple of those, uh, cash and investments, contracting and bidding. Um, this year we issued a, a clean report, no findings to report with Minnesota legal compliance. As you'll see on page three in the, the prior year, there was um, one finding there related to contracting and bidding. Um, we found uh, no issues this year, so happy to report that. So basically, uh, a, a completely clean audit. As part of the audit, we do um, gain an understanding of the organization's internal control uh, solely for the purpose of planning the audit um, and conducting the audit. We do not issue an opinion on the effectiveness of the internal controls. But if there was um, an area where we did see a concern, those are sometimes typical findings we see in our local government audits and again no internal control findings either so now if we turn to the the results of the financial information a few pages in on page five um, we'll cover some of the results for the commission and the, the access corporation and then look at some of the information combined too so on page five um, here we're looking at the the commission's ending fund balance over the the last five years which is indicated by that blue line and we compare that to your next year's budget indicated by the red line. So a couple items to point out. The fund balance has increased each of the last four years in dollar amount and as a percentage of the next year's budget. So you'll see in 2018, the fund balance increased up to about 5.7 million, up from 5.2. Um, that's about 103% of your 2019 budget. Uh, that percentage increase is a combination of the a dollar increase in the fund balance, but also looking at the budget, you'll see um, over since back to 2015, your budget has um, declined to 2019 budget at about 5.6 million, down from about 6.2 in 2015. Now on the next page, page six, here we give a, a budget to actual for both the, the commission and the access corporation. So the top table there is the budget and actual for the, the commission. Total revenues about 250,000 under budget, mainly due to franchise fees coming in lower than uh, budgeted. Expenditures under budget by about 253,000, uh, mainly in the building improvement area. So some of those budgeted expenditures weren't spent. You do transfer out to the Access Corporation. You transferred out about 4.4 million, which was lower than budget by about 660,000. So total fund balance um, increased about 411,000 up to that 5.7 we were looking at on the previous page. Now similar table with the Access Corporation. Um, there you can see the, the revenues, uh, fairly small, mostly supported with that transfer in from the commission that we had looked at above. Total expenses at about 4.5 million, under budget by about 568,000, mainly in the, the program services area. So again, the transfer in about 4.4 million, total fund balance decreased, or net position decreased about 63,000. One item to point out there, you'll see the, the net position is a, a deficit 1.9 million. That's mainly related to uh, 
the the net pension liability. So about four years ago, there's a county standard that um, required you to report your proportionate share of the net pension liability. You participate in a, a multi-employer uh, pension plan, PARA, which you're all aware of, um, and you recognize a proportionate share based on your contributions into that. That net pension liability was about $2 million at the end of 2018. Then the, the next page, page seven, here looking at the, the organization as a whole, the top graph there is your, your revenue, and uh, the bottom graph is your expenditures, giving you a budget to actual comparison to, for both. So looking at the revenues on the top, you'll see, like we saw with the commission, the, the revenues came in lower than budget. Here the red is actual, the blue is the budget. So fairly close, but a little bit lower um, with the revenues declining a little bit over time. Uh, the bottom graph, the expenditures, there the, the total expenditures came in lower than budget in 2018, about even in 2017 and a little bit higher in 2016. The other item to note here is you can see the decreasing trend in those expenditures, the red bar over the three year period. Uh, page eight gives you a revenue breakdown between 2017 and 2018. As you know, the majority of revenue is the, the franchise fees and access fees the percentage split fairly consistent uh, between the two years. And then the, the last item on page nine gives you uh, a 10 year history of your total revenue and then also broken down by franchise fees and the access fees. Um, like we saw in the, the previous financial information, total revenue has been decreasing um, um, over the last couple years, mainly related to that franchise fee um, going down so you can see the decrease from 2017 to 2018. Um, I'll, one other item to point out that you mentioned the compensated absences. There is a, a liability that is recorded there at the end of 2018 is about 466,000. So with that, I'd be happy to take um, any questions or comments anyone has. Any questions for Andy? Not. Okay. Uh, Andy, the uh, on the pension liability, this is a common thing. Just so some of the people who don't work for the cities here is a common thing in all the city audits too. Whoever is uh, uh, offering PERA, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So all the cities do participate in that plan and also record their proportionate share of that net pension liability. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Any other comments? Ask for a motion to approve. Motion, the the audit. Motion, motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Next item is the uh, CenturyLink Franchise Fee Settlement Agreement. Um, Mike, Mike. Okay. Mike and Mike. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, um, I'm going to have uh, uh, our attorney, Mike Bradley, uh, talk about this franchise fee settlement agree uh, agreement and uh, in detail. And um, uh, we are happy that we participated in this audit process because uh, it was um, uh, the Bradley Law Firm that suggested that we could you know, save money if we work together with uh, other uh, entities in the auditing process because the city of Minneapolis went through the audit as did other entities um, that, that have CenturyLink currently as a franchise within their municipality. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Mike and explain uh, how we did. All right, well good morning. Seems like it's been a long time since we've been together. <laughs> And then you look at your uh, action items, and it says Mike Bradley, Mike Bradley, Mike Bradley. So I'll li leave it up to you to s decide if that's good or not. <laughs> the first one is, uh, I think, is good. Um, we have some other ones that are a little more negative, but this one is a good one. Um, like Mike said, we, um, when, in talking to the executive directors uh, for various commissions throughout the area, we um, came to realize that there was some... Um, kind of unusual activity with the payment of franchise fees. And um, the executive directors all followed up with CenturyLink to find out what was going on. And, um, and they got a response, and that response didn't make a whole lot of sense. I think we reported that <laughs> to you um, 
last year sometime. Um, and so we decided then to um, engage Scott Lewis, a financial consultant, who I think has been used here in the, in the past, many years ago. And um, what I wanted to do, though, is I really wanted to not spend a, lo a whole lot of money on this because, you know, especially our commission has only had CenturyLink in place, the franchise in place, since October of 2016, I believe. Um, and so there's not a whole, there's not a ton of franchise fees that are being generated, but um, but there were enough that we wanted to make sure that the franchise fees that they were paying were being paid correctly. So we um, we had a consortium of cities all get together. I asked Scott Lewis to spend more, no more than two hours per jurisdiction, to initially look at the um, the explanations that CenturyLink had been giving us, and. Um, uh, he went through those. He confirmed that no, they <laughs> they didn't make complete sense to him either, um, and it required a little bit more um, digging into. We were fortunate that one of the other jurisdictions in the group uh, was willing to uh, pay for some additional um, uh, research by Scott in, into the uh, underpayments, potential underpayments, and um, I have to say CenturyLink. Uh, really cooperated with us fully through this entire process, and um, and and rather than deny that they made a uh, that they made an underpayment, they agreed they made a mistake. Um, we worked with them on you know what the appropriate numbers were for each jurisdiction, and we and we came up with this uh, settlement agreement. So um, uh, for our area, uh, again, our franchise was granted in October 2016. We reviewed the years 2016 and 2017, uh, and obviously there weren't a whole lot of franchise fees paid by CenturyLink here in 2016. So really, um, and most of the underpayment, frankly, came in 2016 when we did our uh, review. But it, um, for our commission here, the underpayment uh, ended up being 5,638.29, and, um, and CenturyLink has also agreed to pay um, uh, a portion of your costs, or $500. Um, which is really right around what Scott Lewis uh, cost the, the commission to review the, um, the, the um, CenturyLink franchise fees. So our recommendation is to uh, approve the franchise fee settlement that is in your packet with CenturyLink. Mike, I guess you answered my question on that $500. That seemed rather low, but it covers everything. It does. Okay. Yeah. Bill. I'd like to move to approve the uh, settlement agreement that had attachment four, except my uh, motion contains semicolons after the first and last whereas clauses. Great. <laughs> 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 Well, it's taken two years for him to find a. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I know that's good. That's good. No, no, I know. Well, there's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. And any further discussion on it? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Mike, you want to keep right on rolling? Yeah, why don't you go, Mike? Okay, so the uh, the next item is uh, action item three, and we can move to the next slide if um, if staff wishes here. Um, so it's the CenturyLink uh, build out settlement agreement, which is also in your packet. Um, again, our our franchise was entered into in, in 2016. We intentionally had a very short term on the franchise, and that was to make sure that. The commitments of uh, using best efforts to build out or provide cable service to all residents in this area uh, was met. Uh, unfortunately, um, about a year ago, CenturyLink um, uh, uh, top top uh, officials at CenturyLink indicated that they were going to stop providing cable service, um, and and they stopped marketing it in the area and really across the country. Um, and and so now the only way you could get, and this has been true for a while, the only way you can get CenturyLink's cable service is if you call up CenturyLink and ask specifically for Prism Television, uh, and then pay at the what they call their rack rate, which is their highest rate, so an unbundled rack rate, and 
um, as you can imagine since that time, the, um, the su subscriptions to CenturyLink have uh, gone down considerably. Um, I think in, in um, a previous meeting, we, uh, we issued a, an opinion that uh, we thought that CenturyLink might be in violation of their cable franchise by, um, by not using their best efforts to build out to the entire area. Um, and then we, we set up meetings to talk to CenturyLink about that. This is another um, instance where um, we used a consortium of cities and split all of your uh, legal costs across um, you know, a number of five or six jurisdictions. Um, so it's called the build-out settlement agreement. It really could be called the, the transition ag agreement, really, because um, what we wanted to do um, was to um, you know, n not spend a ton of money on compliance because CenturyLink was announcing they were getting out of the cable business. Um, so rather than doing that, we really wanted just to make sure that um, cable subscribers residing in this area were protected, that uh, all of the member cities' interests in the public right-of-way were protected, um, and, allow, uh, to, and to address renewal, because we're actually in the renewal window, if you can believe that, with CenturyLink, um, you know, make it so that we didn't have to spend any more money on that kind of a process, a renewal process. Um, and then just ensure a, a kind of a smooth landing or smooth transition for CenturyLink. And, uh, and that's really what this, this uh, settlement agreement does. So um, just some highlights of the agreement. Um, CenturyLink will agree to, to stop providing cable, its cable service um, uh, on or before the expiration date of the cable franchise, which is October 20th, 2021. Um, any facilities that were used to exclusively provide cable service in, um, in this area uh, will be uh, removed and the right-of-way will be repaired at CenturyLink's cost, um, which is good. But I can tell you, and, and you know this from, for most of you that were in the CenturyLink um, franchise discussions, CenturyLink uses um, its communication system to provide phone and internet. And they're gonna to continue to provide that system to provide phone and internet. So there may be no portions of their system that are used to just provide cable service, but to the extent there was, we're requiring them to remove that part of the system and to repair the, the, the right of way at their cost. Um, the rest of their communication system is subject to um, your permitting requirements and your right-of-way ordinances at your member city level. Um, then to provide um, protections for uh, area subscribers, CenturyLink has to provide notice to its subscribers of its intent to terminate its cable service and provide information to its to subscribers on how to replace the cable service. So CenturyLink must also provide instructions on how to return any on-premise equipment at no charge uh, to the subscriber um, if it's returned within the first 30 days of its discontinuation date. And then finally, CenturyLink is waiving all of its rights under uh, renewal, under the re renewal statute. So we don't have to worry about doing a renewal. They're agreeing that on the termination date of the franchise, the franchise is over and they're no longer authorized to provide cable <coughs> service in the area. With that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Our recommendation is to approve the settlement agreement. On the uh, cable subscriber transition, where they tell the, their subscribers how to secure other uh, or replacement cable services, mm -hmm. do we know what the nature of that direction is, or they just say call somebody else? <laughs> no, there uh, th there'll be a couple of things, right? Um, CenturyLink is one of the largest resellers of Directv. And I know, I, I was talking to a CenturyLink subscriber just yesterday, <laughs> and they're starting that process already in another area. So um, I would expect them to direct people to DirecTV. Um, I would also expect them to, to tell them that Comcast is an option as well. 
Julie. You know, when they came and talked to us and all, they sell, sold us all this bill of goods and everything, um, came to Golden Valley, they never followed through. I think I brought that up. It's really maddening, all the money that's spent and time and involvement in our communities, and they never seem to follow through. They talk big and nothing ever meets the end result. And what kind of company that are they really? I mean, it's amazing to me that they keep going because all this has to cost them money, but just think what it, you know, the time and commitment we put into this and they never really followed through with it. And, and our residents and subscribers. And I think that, um, I don't know for other cities involved here, be careful when you deal with them because they never followed through with Golden Valley either. And uh, I was concerned about that when we started talking and now the same thing has happened here, but the cost to everybody is, you know, it's just uh, ridiculous. And then the time and energy that's spent. And, and Mr. Chair, it's really disappointing, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were, wanting cable competition here for years and years yes. and years. We finally got it and it only lasts for a year and a half. Um, so it is disappointing. And uh, we did spend a lot of time and effort in uh, working with CenturyLink. Um, I think the good news for the commission is that CenturyLink paid for it all. Um, but you're right, I mean, they, CenturyLink paid a lot of money to, mm -hmm. to set up yeah. a head end here and to um, go through the process of getting cable franchises throughout the area um, and to reverse course in such a short period of time was surprising. Well, we had that, uh, you remember that, uh, I don't know, was it a law or whatever, that they came in, everybody had to be set up, but they <clears throat> wanted to take it slow and have one area. It just um, never built up that way because people you know might want it but they weren't able to get it and I just think that uh, that idea that if they come in even though it's very costly everybody has to have the same option not just little area here little area it just didn't seem to work yeah. Mike is it your thought that they could not go head to head with Comcast or their priorities changed or all the above I think a little bit of all of the above. Okay. You know, I think when you when you speak to um, to CenturyLink, they, they will tell you that um, it was difficult for them to compete for a couple of reasons. I think they perhaps underestimated the labor costs mm -hmm. it would take to um, bring cable service to the home. So that last mile piece was uh, difficult because they had to roll trucks to every resident. I don't think they were quite expecting that. And then the other piece is the programming um, contracts that they have to enter into, and it was difficult for them to negotiate the kind of contracts that, that Comcast has. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Mike? Entertain a motion to accept the uh, agreement, settlement agreement. So moved. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. You might as well keep right on yep. going, Mike. Okay, we're going to keep going. <laughs> so um, action items uh, four and five are really a, a combo platter. First is um, item action item number four, which is the cable franchising order. We can move to the next slide. Um, so at, our, at the last time we met, which was in the spring, um, I had given you updates on how we participated in the further notice of proposed rulemaking on a cable franchising uh, matter before the FCC and discussed, um, you know, just how, um, uh, just what a negative impact it would have on local governments if, if the FCC carried through with that FNPRM. Um, I wish I could tell you it got, it got better. <laughs> but it, it didn't get better. Um, but I, I just, with this slide, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of what's happened really since we met, um, which has been a lot, and I think I don't, I don't even have everything on here. But um, 
as you know, we, we submitted uh, comments and reply comments. That was really in the uh, fall and, and winter of, of 2018. But then after that, um, there's a cable industry group called the NCTA. And the NCTA started filing ex parte comments to the FCC. Um, so this is after all the comments and reply comments, which is you know your opportunity to really present your case to the FCC. The NCTA kept submitting um, ex parte uh, communications. And they were in the forms of like letter briefs. They were very dense documents and providing a lot of additional information. And I think the number of ex parte communications uh, ended up being close to eight, seven or eight different communications to the FCC. We threw uh, NATOA then, um, and I'm really proud of this effort, but that NATOA ex parte participation um, was a joint response by a number of the municipal cable attorneys throughout the country um, to, res to respond, and it, it's, it ended up being like a 35-page response because there were so many things to respond to. Our firm took up five of, I think, 10 issues that, were, that ended up being in that um, ex parte by NATOA. Um, it turned out it, it was very good in, in, in our view. Um, we hoped it would have a better impact ultimately. Um, and I, it did, I guess, with two of the three commissioners, but uh, uh, we, we needed one more. Um, we did have meetings with FCC commissioner staffs, and I had the opportunity to go out and to the FCC in Washington, D.C. and talk about uh, our issues with staff members out there. Um, again, this was a coalition type of effort with municipal attorneys and NATOA and the ACM as well, uh, the Alliance for Community Media. And, um, and so I was uh, asked to uh, visit with the Democratic uh, commissioner staffs and, um, and, and did so. And I'll, I'll have to say, they voted the right way. <laughs> the ones I didn't meet with voted the other way. Uh, I'm sure that had everything to do with it. <laughs> So the FCC, that was in June, and then the FCC uh, released a draft order. That's what they've been doing lately on some of the larger um, items before the uh, commission. They, they'll release a draft order and kind of get input from uh, the, the interested parties. So they did that in July, and we um, prepared a summary of what that uh, draft order said, and uh, that I'm guessing Mike probably shared that with you. Um, and then in, in, uh, in August, uh, August 1st, there was a meeting and, uh, and they voted to approve uh, an order. Um, and then that order was ultimately released on August 2nd. It was published later in August and uh, it becomes effective 30 days after publication. And so the order becomes effective on uh, September 26th of this month. And we can go to the next slide, please. So um, in your packet, we, we outlined uh, what, the, uh, what the order does. And, and in, in the simplest terms, it takes non-monetary provisions in cable franchises and calls them now franchise fees. And uh, I can tell you this is completely contrary to what the federal law says a franchise fee is. And franchise fee is defined in federal law as either a fee, a tax, or an assessment. And when you just take the plain meaning of those words, there's, there is in no circumstance an instance where negotiated uh, non-monetary um, services are a fee, a tax, or an assessment. If that's not enough, we can look at the legislative history. The legislative history says it's a monetary fee. If that's not enough, look at the last 35 years of past practice between the cable industry and local governments. If, uh, if such things were to be considered franchise fees, 
you've been through, many of you have been through negotiations with the cable operators. Don't you think that would have been in <laughs> one of our franchises? <laughs> and it's not, and it's not anywhere uh, in the country. Um, and so we think um, this order is, is completely contrary to uh, federal law and the FCC is out of line. But nevertheless, they, uh, the FCC <coughs> voted to include uh, in-kind non-monetary um, provisions in cable franchises as franchise fees. What that means is that um, our traditional franchise fee, which has been 5% of gross revenues, will now be uh, reduced or offset with the non-monetary provisions in, uh, in our franchise. And I have a chart here that's part of your memo too that will go over some of those. So we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, the uh, capital costs were defined. This was actually better than what was originally proposed in the FNPRM. Um, I, I'd like to say it's a win, but it's really not. All, all they did is define capital costs as basically what we've always defined it as. So, um, uh, so that's what they did with, with capital costs. Uh, fair market valuation was another issue that was addressed uh, in the order. So. Uh, that's, an, that's important because when you're doing this offset, you have to put a value on something that's never had a value put on it before. And, um, and so we had argued in, the, in our comments and reply comments that it should be cost-based uh, because otherwise you're allowing double recovery in some instances by uh, the cable operator if you're allowing a fair market value. Um, uh, they disagreed, the, the FCC did, and, and said that it will be fair market value and that the value will be um, essentially um, whatever it is the cable operator charges in the marketplace. And, um, and they say it's, you know, super easy. We'll just look at the rate card. And, that, and so if, they, if they're providing a service on a rate card, that's the fair market value. Well, if any of you have ever looked at a rate card, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you have actually. That's, uh, the rate card is uh, something that Comcast provides to each jurisdiction and it'll identify um, essentially the maximum rate it'll charge uh, subscribers for different services. Um, so it's really their highest rate and it's not the market rate. I would argue it's not the fair market value rate but that's the decision that the FCC uh, made was to use the the rack rate. But as most of you know, and if you're um, a, a consumer of, of cable service, you know, most people get bundled rates. This does not, this does not address, you know, the, the case of getting bundled rates. And when you're buying lots of services, um, you know, and our member cities receive some complimentary cable service, you would get discounted rates. And uh, again, the, the order does not address that. And we can go to the next slide, please. Modification of cable franchises um, to the extent they're necessary. The FCC has um, requested that the local jurisdictions work with the cable operators to uh, modify uh, any cable franchise. This is actually different than w what their draft order came out with, which um, I, th I thought was actually much better um, in the draft order than what ultimately came out because in the draft order it required uh, the cable operator in all instances to come back to the local jurisdiction, the local franchising authority, and go through um, a modification process that's laid out in, in federal law. Um, this is a much more loose uh, process. And then if, if, you, if you read that last sentence in that top uh, part under modification, it says, if a franchising authority refuses to modify, doesn't say if a cable operator <laughs> refuses to modify. Only a local franchisee, that's a direct quote. Um, but just kind of shows you um, the, um, the viewpoint of the FCC on, on, on that issue. Um, so anyway, cable operators are, are required to, um, to at least approach the franchising authorities and ask for modifications. When, there's, um, when that's necessary in order to comply with this order. Um, 
One of the issues that we, that we addressed in, uh, in our comments and reply comments was a concern that if the FCC changed the rules of the road 35 years after the Cable Act was entered into, that the cable operators could go back in time and, and deduct from franchise fees these in-kind services that are now suddenly being called franchise fees. And um, so there's one glimmer of, of sunshine there in that they said, no, this is a prospective order only and not, uh, and not retroactive. So that was, that was good. Settlement agreements was another issue that we raised in the comments and reply comments. There's a lot of settlement agreements or outside agreements with, with cable operators that um, <coughs> address a whole number of different things. Um, and we wanted some assurance that those settlement agreements and the consideration in those uh, settlement agreements and outside agreements uh, were not part of, um, of this order. Um, the FCC did not address that at all. And then uh, finally, and, and this is a small bullet point on, on this slide and, and really probably in our memos too, but uh, the franchise fee is the biggest immediate impact on, on local governments throughout the country. But perhaps longer term impact is on this mixed use network um, uh, order um, a ruling that, that the FCC made in this order. And basically what the, what the FCC said is that if a cable operator is providing other non-cable services, um, a local franchising authority or, or local government, or, and state government for that matter, cannot um, require a license or a franchise for any of those non-cable services. And that is completely contrary contrary to um, what the Oregon Supreme Court had just recently um, decided. And uh, the Oregon Supreme Court in 2016 or 17 basically said, um, yeah, you can franchise um, the cable service and you can also license a uh, telecommunication service like internet service. And um, there are different services, and you can uh, require those different types of uh, authorizations. Um, and, and so in Oregon, they were collecting, I think, a 7% um, license fee on, on Internet. And as, as we all know, we're seeing cable subscriptions drop, and um, Internet subscriptions are not dropping. Right? I mean, I think we all see that, that internet um, services are, are here to stay for a long time. And, um, and so the long-term impact on local governments here in Minnesota and other places, um, I think are really affected by that mixed use uh, order. Okay, next slide, please. And next slide, I think I had two of the oh, same the slide same. there, sorry. Right there. <laughs> so this one, this is hard to read, but it is in your, in your memo too, but um, you can see that, um, oh, and it's not showing up entirely on, on this slide, but um, I'll just refer you to the memo that we put together then. But what we did is, is we put um, two different uh, columns here, and one is um, what are now considered non-monetary franchise fees, and then on the, on the other column, um, what is um, still excluded from franchise fees. So on the right-hand side, you can see that capital cost expenditures remain excluded from franchise fees. But on the left-hand side, you can see a number of things that the FCC specifically identified as now being part of the cable franchise fee. Now that list is not all-inclusive, but uh, we focus just on the things that the FCC specifically discussed in that cable order. So you can see that the, uh, the PEG transport costs is listed in there. PEG channel capacity. While the FCC did not specifically say that the value of access channels will be deducted from franchise fees, they basically said they thought it would but they didn't have enough information to decide what that value might be. 
and so they defer to a um, to another rulemaking procedure to figure that out and they promised that at the FCC um, meeting in August they promised to do that over the course of the next year so this order happens to be the third report in order is a series of orders here um, so peg channel capacity will probably be the subject of the fourth report in order institutional networks um, um, are com basically completely um, considered franchise fees and then free and discounted cable service to uh, public institutions is considered part of the franchise fee as well so that gives you kind of an idea of the changes that have been made by uh, this FCC order and we can go to the next slide please so the uh, while the FCC has made its uh, final determination that's not the the end of the proceeding by any stretch of the imagination and so um, uh, we are putting together a coalition similar to the coalition that we put together to do the comments and reply comments and uh, we will be uh, also partnering with a law firm out of uh, Washington DC and Los Angeles in um, in appealing and requesting a stay of the uh, of this FCC order so in your um, in your packet um, we go over the, the different things that we'll be doing uh, as part of that stay and appeal um, there's a there's a new uh, item that will also be in there now and that is um, uh, there's been an initial appeal by the city of Eugene that will be joining um, city of Eugene Oregon and they appealed to the Ninth Circuit and we had to do that within the first 10 days in order to um, choose the the uh, appellate jurisdiction um, so it's in the Ninth Circuit the FCC um, uh, just re recently moved to uh, move the the uh, venue from the Ninth Circuit to the Sixth Circuit uh, and so we'll be um, participating in the response to that we're also right now working with um, with this coalition group to file a stay with the FCC and that sounds probably silly that we're asking the FCC to stay its own order the reason we have to do that is um, the Court of Appeals rules um, throughout the country each US Court of Appeals rules states that in order to ask for a stay at the Court of Appeals you have to first ask the agency from which you're appealing to voluntarily stay the uh, decision and so that's um, that's what we're doing the uh, stay request will probably be filed sometime next week um, then there'll be the uh, the appeals there'll be motions to stay there'll be full briefings on the motions to stay um, there'll be um, uh, participation in the jurisdiction uh, selection uh, process um, that Sixth Circuit thing um, and then the full briefing before whatever Court of Appeals we're in. We know it's going to be in a United States Court of Appeals, just uh, which one it's for sure going to be in um, uh, will be decided sometime in the fall. Um, and then, of course, oral argument will be at the end. So that is the, uh, the process that we'll be looking at. We can go to the next slide. Um, uh, and, and so our our action item then is to participate in the coalition appeal we can go to the next slide and um, normally the the Commission is at the is at the highest end on the on the fee schedule um, because these fees are I acknowledge they're expensive and but it's going to take a, a ton of work to to um, address this um, we're treating the Commission essentially like a large city based on the population collectively of all your member cities and so that puts the Commission in the um, the second tier the $15,000 fee um, range so that's a fixed fee um, uh, payable uh, in two th 2019 and 2020 um, over three different um, uh, billing cycles um, and uh, as we say in the, in the slide there 
the only way we would uh, be requesting more is if there was something substantially um, different that wasn't anticipated at all. And, and even with that little hiccup in moving um, the case from the, the Ninth Circuit to the Sixth Circuit, that doesn't impact the fees at all. So our recommendation is to participate in the, um, the coalition appeal. I have to say, I, I don't think, you know, I, I've been doing this for over 20 years now, um, and I don't think I've ever recommended participating in an appeal of an FCC order before. But this one has such a, a big impact. You know, when I, when I look at what the order, how the order will impact local governments, Initially, it's probably 10 to 20 percent of the franchise fee. Um, but then, if and when the fourth order is allowed to go in, into effect, it'll be much greater than that, in my view. So, I recommend that you participate. Mike, you have some comments? Yes. Um, if you look at my memo here, I spelled out uh, the various uh, population figures that Mike has here. And uh, the total population of the northwest suburbs is 340,000 combined. Uh, should the Cable Commission decide to participate, our fee would be 15,000. That equals approximately $1,665 <coughs> per member city. And uh, the fee would be paid out of our 2019 uh, legal services budget uh, if approved. So, if all, so there is a, actually there is an advantage if you were instead of going to all the individual cities, uh, if there were a population less than fifty thousand, it'd be like a five thousand dollar thing. But if you look at it because we're a consortium, um, you're spreading that cost out amongst uh, nine different cities, and we truly are uh, at this point. Um, if we don't do anything collectively across the country to fight this, that's a sign to the to the FCC and others that, hey, they must not care about it, and then they're going to go on to the next thing and the next thing. And this is a huge, huge issue for us. And so, um, um, you know, ultimately that decision is up to you. But I just want to say that we, we do have the money uh, to do this, and uh, it breaks down to about $1,600 per city. Questions from the commission? Yeah. Have a feeling for how many other uh, entities like ours are going to appeal? Or, I mean, or is it five percent or ninety-five percent, or are we the only ones? For you're for sure not the only ones. I didn't um, think so. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the fourth commission I think I've been at, and all the other, the third, all three have approved so far. How about on a national basis? Do you have any feeling? National for basis. Um, there is widespread support uh, for appealing. We will have a solid coalition. Thank you. Bill. So um, the mountain of uh, evidence and uh, all the legal proceedings seems to boil down to are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? <laughs> That's how they decided whether they would vote for or against the revisions. If the administration changes over, how difficult is it to um, use that same process and reverse some of these things? That's a great question. And uh, I wish I had all of the answers for that. But I, history is a guide, OK? Um, this is the third report and order. Uh, we had a second report and order that was, um, was also negative to cities. It was appealed. Uh, it, it did go to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals at that time. Which is where? Uh, that is, that's a good question. That is the Kentucky, uh, I think Pennsylvania. Okay. I wish I knew all the states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know that it just came up, so I, I remembered Kentucky for some reason, but um, I think Tennessee as well. I think Kentucky, Tennessee, and one or two other states. Um, the, uh, the Sixth Circuit reversed the FCC on the second uh, report and order and remanded it back to the FCC. That was, um, uh, you know, a few years ago. But, um, but to, to tell you what happened, so, so the second report and order was passed in 2017. The Court of Appeals didn't act until 2015 or 16. There was a really long break. The reason there was a really long break is because 
um, some local governments did a petition for reconsideration. So during the during President Bush number two's administration, the second report and order was issued. Throughout the entire Obama administration, it was never acted on, the petition for reconsideration. Then, um, you know, at the very, I, maybe at the very tail end of the Obama administration, it was finally acted on, which allowed it to go then to the Court of Appeals. So there's, there's no, a, a lot of times when we talk about the, the politics of this, um, and a lot of people, depending on which side they are, are hopeful that you're going to have a better result if, you know, one party's in versus the other. The FCC is not always good, no matter who's in, in power. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and frankly, it's very difficult because these um, communications industries are huge and they are well funded and they um, are known well on the streets of Washington and in, in every administrative agency that touches them. That's just a fact. So you're saying they're big donors? <laughs> to both parties, yeah. <coughs> for sure. Further questions? Jim. Thank you. I don't think that there's any question amongst this body that we have an economic interest uh, to protect if we want to continue to operate this as we've been in the past. But even beyond that, I think that uh, it, our participation will help demonstrate, as Mr. Bright is talking about, um, there is some solidarity across the country about this order is uh, an abuse of uh, power, really. Yes. And it uh, is actually inappropriate given the fact that we have a contractual arrangement, a franchise agreement that was negotiated between the parties. Um, and I, it's, it's outrageous that we're here, but that's where we are, and I think we have to appeal it. And if the motion is required to approve the funding of $15,000, I would make that motion. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second to that? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioners. Action item number six, if we keep moving. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, is called Options for Educational Access Channels, and we can go to the next slide. So, um, you know, we have a number of, of PEG, what we call PEG access channels, and um, for the uh, listening audience, um, PEG stands for Public Educational and Governmental Access Channels. We have two educational access channels that have historically been programmed by the different school districts in, uh, in the commission area. The, um, the schools have, have indicated that they um, are no longer wanting to program those channels and um, essentially are returning those channels uh, to the cable commission. And so that leaves uh, the commission with some different options on, you know, what do we do with these two extra um, uh, access channels? And, um, and there are several options that we, uh, that we laid out for you, and it's uh, in the memo in your packet, but it's also on the slide. Um, the first choice would be to uh, redesignate the, um, the educational access channels as either a public access channel or a governmental access channel, and then start programming those channels if there's adequate programming. Um, a second um, option would be to uh, return the channels to Comcast, um, but reserve those two access channels for future use if we decide under option one that perhaps we don't have the programming to program two uh, extra channels. Um, if we did that, I, I think what we would do is uh, Mike and I would approach Comcast and, um, and enter into some sort of an agreement related to the return of, of those channels, at least on a temporary basis. Um, the third option would be to essentially trade um, uh, access channels for a high definition channel. And so in your cable franchise, you have the option of trading in um, two standard definition access channels and one standard definition local origination channel and in return you would get one HD channel. Um, 
I, you know, based on my experience, that would be a high price to pay for one HD channel, okay? Um, but it is an option, and we wanted to make sure that you had the, uh, what we saw as all of the options available to you. Um, I think Mike has some additional thoughts on, on recommendations, um, but ultimately we'll need to decide between options one through three. Mike. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mike. Um, a, a couple of things. Uh, we've talked about this uh, amongst the staff for a while, and we, um, we it, it is fair to say that we do not need another channel. In fact, we would, our, our feeling is we'd rather, we would rather program less channels good versus having a lot of channels. If you read my memo, I talked about how those channels just pretty much sat with a lot of character generated information. Um, the channels um, themselves would be very hard to program for us. I mean, we're, we're, we're already, you know, we're, we're just with our staffing level right now, just to program the channels we have is a very big deal. If you wanted to program two more channels, it would take, you know, more staff time and involvement to, in order to do that. So, um, you know, so the, so the staff would not want to take on more, trying to program more channels because we feel we have enough channels. And the reason we put the uh, HD option there is it is in our franchise agreement if we want to do it, but staff would be very concerned. Y yes, uh, Mike is correct, that's a very high price to pay, as well as we really don't want to give up the SD12 channel uh, at this point or maybe several years from now because that is still a very good uh, channel position. And what people don't realize is that a lot of people, especially if they have, say, like an Xfinity box, if they, hit tw if they have HD and they go to channel 12, it automatically routes them to the HD signal, so the best signal that we have to offer. And I highly recommend whenever you watch our channel to watch it in HD because it looks a lot better. But I will say this, is we do know that there are people uh, who may not have HD service or still watch things in SD, mainly probably an, an older population that enjoy watching our local programming in standard definition. And they're like my wife, they really don't care whether it's standard definition or high definition. I'm more of a, a, a techno guy. I gotta have the best signal possible. They'll watch it because it's still there. It's maybe not as crisp. So, um, you know, I, from a staff recommendation standpoint, you know, I, I would rather uh, us see uh, some type of option going to this option two. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the franchise agreement, it's probably true in all franchise agreements, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, that these channels really are owned by the cable company. We do not own the channels, they are designated to us. So the cable company in our franchise agreement says they, they, they remain owners of those channels. But we have a contractual right, right. to use them. Right, yes. Questions? So in all that, is there a recommendation? <laughs> yes, I would, I would, I would uh, recommend, I would operate, I recommend op, uh, option two. Any further comments or questions? So, so if we negotiate, um, now they know our negotiating position. That doesn't uh, prejudice us, though, does it? No, <coughs> the, the, the channels are valued. They'll be interested in receiving the channels. All right. I mean, now they know what we're going to do. We can't get anything for that, basically, other than the right to reserve it for the future. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and frankly, um, <coughs> they would be looking at our franchise anyway. They, they, and if they we don't use them, we have to do this. Right. And if we maintain them, then technically if the FCC goes that next level and says these channels are worth X amount and we're going to deduct that from your franchise fees, mm -hmm. that would even be worse. Well, Carol? that brings up are there things that we should be doing to limit the 5% reduction, um, such as returning other things that aren't needed or certain public buildings that I don't care anymore? if uh, cable TV feed goes there or not? Can we do things like that to limit how many dollars they're re reducing our 5% by? Well, ultimately, um, uh, Commissioner Blonigan, is that we, we don't, we haven't heard specifically from the cable company yet. Like, th th to your point, I actually did a little research mm -hmm. on uh, what it would take to just pay 
free cable service in the northwest suburbs because we have free cable service in over 150 buildings. Many of them are schools, libraries, and of course, city buildings. Which kind, kind of aren't really used a lot. Right. And a, just a rough calculation range anywhere between $7,000 and over $10,000 a month for free cable. If, well, if we had to pay for that service. We don't know what's going to happen because the cable company would have to come to us and negotiate that. But I think at that time, you know, this, this group is going to have to make the decision, do we... Well, first off, do we even have the funds to pay for free cable for school districts and libraries? And, isn't even, and is that even appropriate anymore in this type of situation where you have one government entity potentially paying for another government entity's free cable service? So all the things we need to, to consider at some point. Cheryl, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious, how, how much extra is it to switch out for an HD channel? to trade two channels for one HD. I mean, you said it's not worth the cost. What is that? Well, there, did you want to address that, the, the HD, in terms of going to all 16, or I'm sorry, all nine channels of all the cities, you mean? Is that what you're referring oh, well, to? Well, when we talk about option, option three, three, I think maybe what you're talking about is option three, yeah. and that was a high price to pay. Um, I, <coughs> I've never, you know, I, I, I deal with Comcast quite a bit, and. Um, in franchise renewal discussions and and this is a topic that comes up a lot is you know we want more HD channels um, and, and usually Comcast's position is well if you give us two SD channels we'll give you one HD channel in our cable franchise it requires the return of three SD channels so that's what I mean by it's a, a, a pretty high price to pay and that you would be giving up three standard definition channels instead of two or less Any other questions? If not, entertain a motion. No, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I watch Channel 12 a lot. And uh, I like the news and the information and the parades and the concerts and all that. And I don't care too much for the sports. When the program is interrupted with sports, then. So how about taking one of these channels and making it dedicated to sports? <laughs> Um, I, you, we would obviously have to uh, discuss that, but there is a, there's an advantage of having a mixture, and quite frankly, we're not, we're not um, uh, sports is also a, a very high viewership thing too, and there's a value of having programming intermixed amongst each other. That would, what that would mean is then on channel 12, you would just have more and more and more and more repeats of the same things that people can also get on demand. So I, I don't know if uh, uh, that would be a good thing for Channel 12 in itself because what makes Channel 12 strong is the variety of programming, the professionalism, and the fact that there are other options to see things through some uh, you know, value-added online options of seeing it over the internet too. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> Entertain them. Oh, I'm sorry. What uh, would be our bottom line of the fewest channels that we would have and still <clears throat> maintain our position as a community access organization? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Dr. Orn, the, um, if you recall, because you were, in fact, you were one of the original members when we had I think we had 15 to 20 channels designated for this organization. We had channels for interfaith access, um, religious access, labor access, all kinds of access, arts access. And just over time, you know, more and more of those channels were, were um, uh, given back because they just weren't used. Case in point, just the, the school districts are, are, you know, pretty much admitting, saying that they don't have the people, the time to produce programming, to fill it up. And so um, I think we're, we're at the point, in terms of getting to the core of your question, we're, uh, we're probably at that point where this is, this is good enough. And, and we would rather have, and, and especially with other options out there in terms of distributing content, because there's a lot of people in this room that get content, and especially the younger generation, are getting content delivered in different ways. So um, 
I think we're about where we need to be right now in terms of the, the numbers that we have, which is the, 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 12, the, ch the channel 12, and we have two uh, public access channels. And that's, that's good enough. Any other questions, comments? Ask for a motion for option number two. So I'll make that motion. Motion has been made and seconded. Further comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, now, a non Mike Bradley item. <laughs> Mike I'll, I'll make it really quick. In fact, this is uh, going to take uh, hopefully less than one minute. I uh, included some information items in your packet. Some of these you had received electronically. Some of them have been put in here that you may have not received. But uh, the most recent one was the idea of the call center uh, in, uh, in Minnetonka that they're looking at eliminating 235 jobs for their call center. Of course, you know, my, our main concern would be we want to make sure that the phones are still being answered and routed and not necessarily going to the Philippines and things like that. Because I handle uh, the escalated complaints for all your cities, and if I see an increase in that, certainly we're going to be talking to the cable company. But again, we can't tell them how to run their business, but there are certain, you know, minimum customer service standards. Uh, I also told you about Apple offering a $5 a month streaming service because streaming is where things are headed. Uh, I have a memo from Carly Werner about Internet Essentials and the growth of that uh, in terms of the low cost uh, options of having uh, Internet service. And then uh, some channel changes uh, within a memorandum from Comcast. And then an article about cord cutting is getting uh, freaking ugly according to the, to the, to the title here. And that is true, and that will be some of the things we'll be talking about in just a little bit here. But um, uh, I do want to say that, um, uh, that there was also an article that I literally got this morning um, talking about 60 million, they're expecting 60 million U.S. households to access video exclusively through streaming um, um, within, the next, within the next couple of years here. Uh, by 2024, which is just a couple down, uh, uh, years down the road, that the vast majority are going to be getting their video signals from, from video streaming. And so that's happening uh, right before our eyes. Then there's another one about showing Comcast uh, uh, their latest earnings. And, and I like the title. It's, it's like a casino. The house always wins. Uh, cable shrinks while broadband booms. Mike talked about uh, the fact that Internet service is not going down. In fact, that's going up. So no matter what, even if yeah, Comcast is not going to lose as people are cutting the cord because people still need, you know, their internet service. I provided some financial numbers there, and then uh, uh, a one-page uh, summary on the uh, 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 Supreme Court uh, ruling in the uh, the Halleck case uh, regarding uh, public access. So that's the communication, and I'll briefly turn it over. Mike, Act. I think you skipped item you action skipped. item seven. Yeah. Oh, the budget uh, referral. Oh, Boy, did I miss? Referral. You know what? I went ahead of that. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Let's get right into that. Uh, that's why I saw it up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this one will take more than a minute. Um, we want to talk about the 2020 uh, proposed budget, and you have that entire packet here. This this is all going to go to the budget uh, executive committee and the budget committee. And uh, this uh, packet is laid out typically as we've laid it out in before. We will be uh, updating the mission statement in here as well as the 10-year targets once we get our strategic plan approved, which will be talked about in a fairly short period of time. You see the table of contents with all the various things uh, here uh, that we're uh, going over. Here you see the, uh, I want to point to the graph that's, uh, that's up on the screen right now, and that's that shows you uh, the cable subscriber trend, all right? So um, without having, you have the actual numbers within your packet, but this trend line um, is showing, uh, that goes from 2010 to 2019. And so from 2010 to this year, we've lost an estimated 12,000 cable subscribers, okay? So it's, that's a significant amount. And for the most part, we didn't lose uh, you know, any money. If we go to the next slide, you will see often talked about even though cable subscribers went down, our revenue would go up because 
the cable company would keep increasing the price of cable and that negated any subscriber loss. So in 2018, that, be, that was really uh, the tipping point in terms of our revenue finally going down. And uh, there was a, a, a approximately three, in fact, it's in the audited numbers. And as you saw, that we had a very clean audit and that we're managing our money and, and, and reserving money kind of for these rainy day things that are, and it's beginning to rain, let's just put it that way, and, and soon to pour. So uh, we're also estimating, you know, further drop here in, in 2019 in terms of these franchise fees. You'll see more dips in the peg fee, you know, as time goes on, because that is related to subscriber loss. The reason the dollar amount is, is up there is because we did get an increase in our, in our initial peg fee from a dollar a month to like a dollar 36 a month uh, when we originally um, uh, uh, renegotiated the, the franchise agreement, which will go until 2024. So um, that chart uh, shows you that, that tipping point and, and where we sit uh, revenue-wise. And I mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the 12,000 um, subscriber difference between the two. So now if we go to the next slide, this is an example of a slide you don't normally use in a PowerPoint presentation because you can barely read it, right? But I'm just putting that up there for reference purposes because within, within our uh, presentation here, we have various revenue scenarios that we put in, um, basically A through E. And we could run scenarios until we're blue in the face, but just for simplicity, um, uh, you know, I just, I'm just showing um, scenario A here, which is basically the exact same thing you have in your packet, except it's grayed out versus yellow because it was printed in, in black and white. And the main highlight of the difference between each scenario from A through E is the, is the grayed out area where we're showing different levels of revenue uh, coming into this organization because uh, we know that now we have to start, we need to shift gears and go back and um, start gaining uh, a significant amount of revenue over the next several years. Uh, as you know, uh, in the past, we, we sold advertising and made several hundred thousand dollars on advertising until Comcast came forward and said, hey, you know, we'd like to sell it for you and they didn't really want to compete with us. Well, in that, in, in that agreement, we ended up not making out very well when all, all is said and done. And we're at the point where we're ending that little agreement with them and we're going back and we're saying we're going to go back and we're going to sell our own channel and do it and, and really push it because there's more incentive for us to sell it than them. That, this would be like, a, hey, do you want ESPN and CNN and maybe we'll throw in CCX Media on top of that. Um, we, we need uh, to start making money from many different ways. And we've already experimented over the, this past year, you know, we've, we've done like a, uh, okay, for, for advertising we know we can sell because we've done that in the past. The other options we're going to be looking at and have experimented with is services for hire. We did a project for Prudential Insurance that I told you about in various emails where we um, did a production, received thousands, several thousand dollars to record one meeting. And that was at the facility over in Maple Grove. Um, we, have, was, we were hired by the Anoka Hennepin School District to cover a special meeting as a kickoff for their year. They paid us money to cover the meeting. So these are the things that we're going to have to start to look at. We're, we're going to look at sponsorships. We're, we're doing a, an experiment sponsorship uh, situation right now. Uh, thanks to Dave, has been working with uh, Chick-fil-A out of Maple Grove, and they are sponsoring uh, this game, of, or the, the Play of the Week segment that uh, Steve Brockhouse, who does all of our social media and is running the PowerPoint uh, presentation right now in the control room, has put together these plays of the week, which are very popular segments. And so we are driving, uh, you know, consumers, you know, we, we've got content there that consumers want to see and advertisers want to advertise where people are looking at the content. So we feel, we, we've made, we feel like we're in a good position going forward, you know, after Sue does her presentation, to make uh, a significant amount of revenue um, to not be fully self-supporting. We've got a long way to go there. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's a long, long, long road. But uh, what I'm saying is we have content. We've got the delivery methods perfected here, especially through various internet means and all the channel, the, the channel delivery too. But the growth area will be 
in a digital <laughs> delivered mode. And we need to uh, do whatever we can to capitalize on all of these things. And so we can do for we can cover meetings. We can we can uh, help people with their websites and do little video pieces, little uh, one minute or two minute videos for them. We've got uh, the the good thing we've got going here in the entire Northwest is we've got a big business base. We've got a lot of companies, a lot of organizations that we can provide video services for. It's going to take some time to ramp up to get ultimately to, you know, to that point. But what I'm saying here is these scenarios show like what, you know, how does this affect the bottom line de depending on how much more money you make. Now we don't know exactly how much money we're going to make. I'm just throwing out different scenarios. I, you know, I, I feel comfortable that we will definitely make, you know, hundreds of thousands. You know, will we make it, will, you know, how long will it take to get to a million dollars and that type of thing? Time will tell. But the key thing is we have content. And this content, they always say content is king, right? We have really good content here. Now we just need to sell it in, in another way to help offset this, uh, uh, the loss in franchise fee revenue. We, uh, we are also going to be looking at, um, you know, the various things through the nonprofit uh, sector of maybe getting some grants. I know uh, Commissioner Sanis has told me that we can most likely get some money from the state uh, legacy grant to continue our history series as an example. Uh, we can look at a donation system. We're going to be looking at uh, having options for people to donate to the organization. And beyond that, you know, there's all kinds of things being talked about at various uh, conferences and things, and even at the state level. Uh, the state of Massachusetts is looking at having a, a bill to maybe have some type of tax on over-the-top TV services to help fund community TV operations. So there's a lot of things we can look at there. And um, so I just want to say that, uh, that the revenue is definitely you know, changing there, and you see those numbers. And I don't want to sugarcoat anything because I'm showing you uh, in, in this scenario, I am showing you a 6% loss every single year uh, going forward. And also, there's a corresponding uh, reduction in our, in our budget, too. So, it, so if it, if it um, uh, but we can make up for lost ground through various means. And so we're going to be looking at that. So this next year will be a, a pivotal year in terms of if figuring out, like, what is the capacity? What do we think we can do? And, and then, um, you know, get staff ramped up to do these things. Like I said, we've done all kinds of little experiments, but we need to get all hands on deck. I say that here to the staff, and we need to look at all the different ways of uh, uh, helping uh, support the organization. So, because uh, the trend is there. Um, I, I, you see the trend line of subscriber numbers going down, obviously. I, I, I'm going to predict here at some point, you know, we, you know, in, in some respects, in, in, in fact, in most of our cities, we're already under 50% of cable penetration rates in your city. So that's why it's also important we be on the internet. Everybody asks about channels, but if, if we're in, 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 in one or two of our cities, we're in the 35 or 40% range of people who have cable service. So it's important that we offer this content to 100% of the people in your community. And that's where, our, that's where our growth is going to be. So does anybody have any uh, questions about the, the, the revenue scenarios before I move on? Because this was all going to be talked in detail at the budget committee and things like that. But um, I, because I have all these scenarios, we're going to be creating some more uh, uh, beyond this. But I will say one other thing about the uh, for the longest time, we've had this, the bottom line, we've always had this um, kind of like this $2 million, we don't want to go below this $2 million reserve that we've always had in place. And I, we haven't I, I've, I haven't touched that in all the years I've managed this place, and I'm not even, and, and, and I'm trying to keep that even within these scenarios. So, so, so do know that within whatever ultimately is done, we want to, we, we, we we don't plan on dipping into the reserves unless we absolutely have to. And secondly, we also need a reserve that, you know, for uh, any liabilities for uh, vacation, sick time, payouts, that type of thing. That's in our audit report. You have to have money set aside for those things. So um, we're not even near getting to that point, but I'm saying that when we do these scenarios, we're always going to try to protect that and look at various things that we can do 
to keep the organization uh, going. So I will be uh, totally frank, this is the hardest budget I've ever worked on in my entire life. Uh, here at uh, my history here, which has been ever since I was a little skinny kid with, uh, with uh, what did I, I was very skinny at the time. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but um, I will, I, I don't even know if it's, I don't want to take a lot of time because we're going to run out of time here, but I do want to say that um, um, we're going to talk about uh, um, the, uh, you know, how we uh, compensate employees in an era when we're, when we're, um, starting to lose money, so we need to have that discussion at the budget committee. Uh, budget committee. Um, what we're presenting for both budgets is a budget that is 3% uh, less than the previous year. So um, that's, we're just basically requesting that this uh, move forward to the budget committee and executive committee for discussion. And we'll bring it back in November. And I'll a answer any questions anybody has. Questions for Mike? I make a motion you send it to the budget committee. Motion's second. been made. Second. <laughs> and did you second? Yep. Motion's been made and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed carried. Okay. We're going to skip Mike's line. I think we'll go right down to the SET. Okay. All right. That's fine. All right. Um, Do you have to make a motion? Yeah, well, turn? we'll. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn the commission meeting and we'll move on to the, the next um, one. The motions have made. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Okay, so we'll call the board of directors meeting to order. Uh, first thing on our agenda is the consent items, the minutes and the treasurer's report. <laughs> Got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Um, it was Dwayne and Ann were the, the two people. Uh, all those opposed? All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you to also move the budget if you want to do that too. Yes, I'll do that. So, so we've got a motion second. from Dwayne and second from Ann. Uh, we're going to pass the budget over to the executive committee and the budget committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. Okay, um, uh, Madam Chair, wanna, I won't read my memo. I just want to welcome, everybody knows Sue here. Uh, Sue is here to just uh, give us just a brief overview of our final strategic plan. I want to thank all of our staff, all of you for participating, all the stakeholders that took part in this process, and Dave Kaiser for helping out a lot in this whole, uh, there was just a lot of details, and I want to just send it over to Sue. Take it away. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, well, Mike, in the, in the conversation that's just been going on with regard to budget, really sets up this conversation about the outcome of the strategic planning process. Um, as staff know, and even, even for all of you, uh, developing a strategic plan is not a quick, easy thing. It requires a lot of input and a lot of people's engagement and involvement because we're really looking at um, providing a roadmap for the future of the organization. And, and that roadmap needs to anticipate um, roadblocks, okay, um, and uh, we've, uh, we're facing one right now with what's happening at the FCC is a perfect example. So what I want to do this morning is just give you a sort of a 30,000 foot overview of the process that we went through in developing the strategic, strategic plan for you all, um, what some of the key things are in a strategic plan. You have the document in front of you, so I'm going to kind of refer to certain pages as we go along. So let's go to the next slide, please. So what I have on the screen here is actually on page two of the report, the strategic plan. And what it simply lays out is the steps that we went through, the things that were done in order to gather information that to build a strategic plan. Obviously, there are many um, meetings between myself and Mike and Dave to lay out a work plan and a timeline for the work that was done to ultimately develop the plan. Um, we prepared a board self-evaluation self uh, report um, yeah. survey which all of you participated in which was a very helpful um, and planned and conducted um, two different uh, board commission study sessions we also did a similar kind of uh, study session with staff as well to help set folks up for the next steps in the uh, strategic planning process 
Um, we then undertook a SWOT process of looking at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that are going to be felt, faced by community <coughs> media centers across the country, as well as just in general groups like the commission. I mean, you're, you're bound together as two organizations that are interlocked. And so the SWOT process really looked at both the board and the, and the, um, and the commission itself. And next slide, please. We undertook a review of uh, current CCX media mission statement, vision statement, core values, and 10-year and targets. And as a result of that, there's some tweaks, which I'll be presenting to you in a few minutes, some slight changes to those documents. Um, we looked at budgets. We looked at operating policies for the organization. We looked at staffing. We looked at um, hours of programming. We looked at equipment and facilities. All of that to get a handle on where we are today and then to be informed by the public input process as to where we should be going in the future. And, and that was uh, done in several ways. We conducted two community stakeholder meetings, um, selected folks from around the community were invited to come to these meetings. We had 56 participants in those. We had a very detailed um, a, a staff stakeholder meeting with 39 staff participating. Uh, and then we conducted an online survey um, and had 70 participants, again, selected participants in that online survey. All of that information all that came from these roughly 10 steps kind of inform the strategic plan that is now before you. So let's go to the next slide. So we have, um, in going through the, the examination of mission statement, vision statement, et cetera, um, a few minor changes. First is simply a name change from uh, uh, Northwest Community Television to CCX Media. Clean, simple adjustment. Um, in your revised mission statement, we clean, it was cleaned up a little bit uh, just to make it a little bit more succinct, okay? As we looked at the revised core values, which was the next thing, um, we added one, which was, and this really came out of input, was um, in addition to serving the communities, uh, displaying honesty, integrity, and demonstrating professionalism, we also pro <coughs> promote dialogue and discussion. That's it's absolutely critical particularly when we're in a time of change, is to have ongoing communications and dialogue and discussion as part of the core values. Um, a very minor but important tweak to the niche, and that is to not only deal with program content development, but also media services. And this goes right to the heart of some of the things that Mike mentioned earlier when he was going through an overview of the budget issues that will be uh, looked at because really this we're looking for long-term financial and sustainability when we look at the strategic plan because of all of the changes that are happening and we've just talked about a few of them this morning um, and then if you look at the next slide um, and that is to look at the revised uh, core focus um, and that basically as you can see we made we made we we took out produce programming okay and we and ch it was changed to offer opportunities to create local media content. Again, getting that word programming out, getting the media services concept more interweaved into, I mean, you sort of, you're, you're experimenting with it anyway. It's just the next logical step as technology changes, as how people use media tools and consume media in their communities change. We need to broaden that vision of where the organization is going. And then also being a source of information by documenting changes and the impact they have on our community. So those are the changes, those are the sort of core documents that came out of the strategic planning process. What I'd like to take you to now is the next slide. So when you're developing a strategic plan, you, you basically have, an, an, our approach to strategic planning um, is not one of those things where you two get two giant volumes you put on a shelf and you never look at it again. <laughs> okay. So what you're gonna see in this strategic plan is really the key things are what are, the co what are the goals, what are the strategic initiatives under each goal, and what is the roadmap? And we try to lay that out on a Gantt chart, okay? So let's first look at what the four key strategic goals are that came out of the process that you all and the community participated in. First one, build long-term financial stability. Develop a broad and diverse funding base that will support and sustain CCX media on a long-term basis while staying true to the CCX media mission. The next strategic goal, staying, expanding CCX media brand recognition. One of the things we found out as we went through this process is that some people never made the jump from Northwest Community TV to CCX media. What that told us was our branding process was good, but it needed to continue, all right? And so this goal 
grows out of the information that came out of getting this information from the community. Build in upon and expand the ongoing branding process in order to significantly increase the reach of CCX media in all sectors of the community. Our third strategic goal that grew out of the process, provide media services and content that meet the needs of the community served. Sort of logical when you think about it and when you listen to what people, but again, the key media services, rather than just programming or shows, okay, is one of the things that really drives where I think this field is going and where your organization as a leader in the field is going. And that, in short, is evaluate and make changes to CCX media services and content to meet the needs and interests of the community on an ongoing basis. And then the fourth strategic goal, continue to build and maintain a strong, well-managed organization. And that's, that's one of the things that you've done over the years, and I think it will absolutely be critical to keep on that path based on the input received from all parties involved. And that goal states simply, build a well-managed organization that is nimble and able to make changes as needed to evolve with a rapidly changing technology, media service, and legal and policy environment. So those are your four goals. Now I want to flip you over, if you, if you go to the document, because the next slide, we'll go to the next one, will be hard to read, okay? <laughs> um, but go to page 13. What we did was we took each of the four goals and we mapped them out, okay? with the goal and then with various strategic initiatives under each goal and in certain tasks. We did not get down to the minutia of laying out every single task that needs to be undertaken to a, uh, achieve an initiative or a goal. That's really something for staff and the, <coughs> and the board to go through when you go through your an, annual planning processes. So, but I wanted to lay this out. So if you go to page 13, and I will flip it up too because I can't read it on the screen. Um, I'm taking you directly to the, the Gantt chart. Each of the goals and each of the strategic initiatives are also, also laid out in the section of the report prior to that, but uh, uh, for purposes of time this morning, I wanted to basically take you directly to a couple of the goals in the Gantt chart so you can kind of see how they lay out. So let's take a look at goal number one, and that's, on this, that's partially on this first slide. So build, long, build long-term financial stability. Well, look at 1A. This is the first initiative. Develop and implement a plan to diversify funding sources. Now, now, you, now we're going to go down into the sub things below that. Explore, prioritize, and implement earned income activities without compromising core values. So we have a time frame for de development and a time frame for implementation. And then there are certain things that bullet under that. If we look at 2, undertake an analysis to determine how to implement opportunities to monetize the news, sports, and event programming. And then we go and we break it down underneath each of, underneath that um, particular <coughs> task under the initiative of development, implementing a plan to diversify funding. <coughs> Number three, continue to explore and implement online revenue generation opportunities through YouTube, Google, et cetera. That's one of the things you, you all have been doing. Um, and it clearly looks to me like given the amount of content you have on YouTube and the monetization is happening already, that this is something you're into already, it looks like it's being successful, let's just continue it, okay. Develop a rate card facility for facility and equipment rental, okay. Um, develop policies and procedures to implement items one through four above. You see how this follows very logically, okay. Um, explore and prioritize underwriting and partnership opportunities with nonprofit, educational, and business sectors that can generate both dollars and or expanded recognition in the community. And that, that mix of expanding recognition and dollars, they go hand in hand throughout this plan, okay? And so as we go through this, if we go to um, uh, the next slide, I think we're on now the next slide, you'll see, again, more of the steps. 1B, and I'm going to take you to that and then we'll dive into item 4 just to give you a sense. 1B is the next strategic initiative under goal number 1, which is to build long-term financial stability. Maintain and expand relationships with cities and keep their staff and elected officials up to date about CCX Media achievements, services, and history. Logical thing you should be doing, okay, but it all builds into this goal of long, building long-term financial stability. 
So you see how the work plan sort of lays out with each goal. Now, the other thing about this is there's four goals, and things are going on simultaneously. They're linked between goals one, two, three, and four at times. Um, and so the roadmap, by having the Gantt chart, you can really see how that all lays out. Um, I'll go to 1C under strategic goal number one, just to give you a sense, maintain and expand relationships with corporate, educational, and healthcare institutions. Again, we sort of break it into different pieces. And then finally, be a leader in federal and state legal and policy matters to ensure PEG support, franchise fees, and other compensations for the use of the public right of way are preserved. All of these things fall under that ultimate goal up here of building long-term financial stability. This is something that's not going to happen overnight, as Mike indicated in your budgeting process. It's something you're going to be working toward. You're going to start step by step and moving through the thing, through the activities. One of the things that we talked about, for instance, under this one is if we're going to get into the advertising business again, as you were a long time ago, and coming back and getting out of the relationship with, with, um, with Comcast, you have to develop policies. You have to develop procedures and steps. So th all of those things sort of build toward being able to begin to implement. Now, I'm going to go to the next slide, which is going to show us um, some of the things. And I'm going to jump right to goal number four, OK? <coughs> There's, uh, because I wanted to give you a bit of a sense of some of the things that were in goal so number four. Pause just, a, pause just a moment. Um, we've got people that are needing to leave, and I okay. want to make sure we get our two motions in before we lose a quorum. Got it. Uh, so Sue did a nice job of presenting the uh, updates to the media mission statement and all that, that we just went through this. And your action item two is a motion to amend the mission, uh, media mission and vision statement. Is there a motion to do that? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, the other thing is a budget request and plan of implementation for closed captioning budget. Is there anything you need to say about that? Uh, nothing. It's pretty self-explanatory. I'm just recommending that it get approved. Move approval. Second. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, Sue, please proceed. We, we, I wanted to make sure we got I'm putting our, you all to sleep our, with the strategic no, planning no. stuff. Sorry about that. Oh. Before uh, <laughs> uh, we lose anybody else, we also uh, We should also approve the strategic <laughs> plan that you're presenting. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion? <coughs> Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Everybody. Thank you. So just <laughs> summarizing, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, item number, uh, strategic goal number four, um, which is, uh, I pulled that, put that up on the, um, on one of the slides and two of the slides is to build and maintain a strong, well-managed organization. And I wanted to bring this one to your attention only, this goal, only because it really does go to the heart of some of the things that came up from the board in the self-evaluation study, and that is that you have senior management who are senior. <laughs> and that there may, huh? And that there may need to be management changes over the next X amount of years here. Um, and so, um, and in order to maintain a strong and well-managed organization, we need to be anticipating those sorts of things. And so, when the board did a self-evaluation study, some things came up with regard to these matters. So, goal number four sort of touches on some of those key things. Four uh, A is. Identify changes need to implement the strategic plan, duh, okay, <laughs> and um, respond to potential reductions in available funding. And we have uh, identified the need to do, uh, undertake a workforce planning process to address the differences in the way the organization will need to be staffed and when we're going a, new, a, a slightly different direction we've gone in the past. So that is one of the steps under item under this item is to take that do that workforce planning process, analyze the workforce. I won't go through all of it. And then uh, 4B is to identify planning that needs to be undertaken to address the number of senior level staff that are close to retirement, which also ties right into the workforce planning process. Okay. So I wanted to bring this particular goal up because it sort of underpins a number of the ability to move forward in some of the other areas. Um, and it was also something that really did come out from the board self-evaluation study 
um, self-evaluation survey that you all filled out. And then um, just also under um, item number 4C, implement staff training opportunities and maintain good, on 4D, maintain good financial management um, policies. So kind of, kind of putting a bow on it. it may look slightly complicated as you look at look at it but I think by putting it on the Gantt chart it begins to show you how the pieces fit together staff is certainly um, clear about the work that's going to have to be done um, to implement this thing but I think it really does based on your input and your community's input I think take you in a direction that I think will help you to maintain long-term stability and, and financial uh, uh, revision Questions? My mother told me I got too complicated sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot, of, a lot of really good information for us to go through and learn from. So thank you so much for uh, helping lead us through this process. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, uh, uh, thank you, Sue, for your time and efforts. And the, the staff really enjoyed uh, working with you through this process. Um, so we can't thank you enough. You were um, um, very professional and friendly. You got that Midwestern, that Midwestern <laughs> charm, and everybody's uh, happy with the process. <laughs> Versus somebody coming in from New York City saying it's my way or the highway, right? So a uh, great job there. And um, so, and I only the only other thing I wanted to point out, Madam Chair, is the uh, staff reports that are in here. Uh, going forward, we will always have uh, printed staff reports in addition to any verbal reports we, we do. We knew we weren't going to have any time to do any verbal uh, uh, or any presentations today due to the size of the agenda, but um, uh, starting now and moving forward, you will always receive, just, just in cases like this and if you cannot make a meeting, you'll have a good idea of what's going on. So. I want to thank the staff for doing a great job on those reports um, for us. I really like the format. Thank you. We got great. Well, I'm glad you said that because Barb Nolan is in the control room right now, and uh, she <laughs> she is the brainchild behind that format. So I, I hope she's in there, and I hope she's got a big smile on her face. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. All right. So we took care of all our business. The only thing left is to adjourn. We'll be adjourned. Adjourned. Seconded. Seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.